continue on. In order to know what the doctrine of the Trinity is all about, we must have a correct definition of what it means. Both Webster's and Funk and Wagnall's dictionary defines the Trinity as the state or character of being three. Any union of three parts or elements in what? One. A three full substantial or sharing the same substance, personality existing in one divine being or substance. This is what Trinity means. The union of one God, of, of, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three infinite persons or what these definitions that, that I looked and found. So the doctrine of the Trinity teaches that three infinite persons who all share the same what? Substance makes up one God. Now, do all three of them share the same substance? No. Or one God divided into three parts. It is extremely important that this point is clearly understood. Trinity does not mean that there are three gods, but it means that there is only one God, which is shared among what? Three, three persons. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity defines God as being one God existing how? In three co-equal, co-eternal, uh, consubstantial divine persons. God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons sharing one homosemium, and this is according to Wikipedia. So let's look at com consubstantial. Of the same substance or essence used especially of the three persons of the Trinity in Christian theology. So this, this using the same essence is a wrong thinking when it, when it comes to the Godhead. Homosunian, homosunian is a Christian theological term most notably used in the Nicene Creed for describing Jesus as same in being or same in essence with God the Father. The same term was later also applied to the Holy Spirit in order to designate him as being what? Same in essence with the Father and Son, again from Wikipedia. So the terms Father, Son, and Spirit are but symbols which stand for three manifestations of God. God goes forth from himself in the eternal Son, returning to himself in the eternal Spirit. This is from the Dictionary of All Scriptures and Myths by G. A. Gaskell. This dictionary uses the philosophic, sacredly held writings of all religions, such as Zoroaster, Philio, Swedenborg, Buddha, Hermes, Quibala, etc., in order to derive its definitions. Hence, the definitions given are mystical, occultic, and spiritualistic in nature. So do you understand where we, where we do wrong by using the word Trinity? Catholic origin of the Trinity, the first council of Nicene formed in AD 325 was a group of bishops who were based in what is now Turkey. They confirmed the use of the term Trinity, particularly regarding the ideas of God as father and son. Their first council of Constantinople confirmed the nature and role of the Holy Spirit in 381. So from 325 to 381, then the Holy Spirit then was added. So who believes in the Trinity doctor then here in Protestant America? Well, the, the uh, doctrine of the Trinity of only one God manifesting three beings sharing the same essence or substance and making up just one God is believed by the Roman Catholic Church, obviously. They say in God, there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost equal in all perfections. This is from the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, page 31. So in fact, the Trinity doctrine is the central doctrine of what? The Catholic faith. Upon it are based all other teachings of the church. And this is from the handbook for today's Catholic. So this is where all their beliefs come from. Guess what? Seventh-day Adventists. Also, in fundamental beliefs, number two, the Trinity. They say there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. This is from the uh, 2000 SDA Church Manual. It's also, you can find it in the 27 Funnel Beliefs. I know there's 28, but this is from the 28, 27 Funnel Belief book that I got this information from. How about the World Council of Churches? 
The World Council of Churches is a fellowship of churches which confess the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior according to the scriptures, and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling to the glory of, of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So much in common. Co-authored by who? The book called So Much in Common was co-authored by the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the World Council of Churches. So we just had to have our name put into it, didn't we? The World Council of Churches is made up of various council or ships of churches from around the world who have chosen uh, 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 to, get, uh, to be together in this great union. But before any church can seek admittance in the World Council of Churches, listen what has to happen. It must first embrace the Trinity doctrine. So you can't be part of the World Council of Churches unless you adopt what they believe as what the Trinity is, okay? So all churches which are connected with the World Council of Churches have embraced this Trinity doctrine. And what are the uh, names of these churches? Those churches which have, have connection with the World Council of Churches include, but are not limited to, the uh, Christian Church of God, Disciples, uh, Episcopal, Evangelical Congregational, Fundamental uh, Evangelical Reformed, Free Evangelical, Free Methodist, Friends or Quakers, Holiness, Independent Baptist, Independent Pentecostal, Lutheran, Lutheran Evangelical, Mennonites, Methodists, Moravians, Nazarene, Old Catholic, Orthodox, Eastern Orth uh, Oriental, Presbyterian, Protestant, Ep Episcopal, Reformed, Roman Catholic, Salvation Army, and who else? This is from their website, brothers and sisters. Seventh-day Baptist, Southern Baptist, United Church of Christ, United Methodist, United Missionary, United Presbyterian, Wesleyan Methodist. So do you understand the compromises that have been being made? You can see that the vast majority of Christendom are involved in believing this Trinity doctrine. And the Trinity doctrine is the belief that there is only one God, which is shared between three persons. Also remember that the basis for this Trinity belief is not founded where? It's not found in the Bible but is founded in the teaching of spiritualism and the occult. So if you want to be a believer in spiritualistic and occultic doctrine, then continue to believe that there is only one God who's made up of three persons. Do you understand? This is occultic teaching and in nature as well. So this is why it's important for us to understand that we must be preparing and have a right and a correct understanding of the Godhead, not the Trinity, and each person that uh, is made up of the Godhead. The doctrine of the Trinity, which was established in the council, uh, in the church of the Council of Nice in 8325, this is from Jane Andrew. So can we trust Jane Andrew? Yes. This doctrine destroys the personality of who? Of God and his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wow. Powerful. These, this is one, was our first missionary, the man that could recite, rewrite the Old Testament and the majority of the New Testament. His children, after, within six months of going to France, was teaching the French how to speak French correctly. Interesting, huh? As fundamental heirs, this is James White, we might class with this counterfeit Sabbath other heirs. So there was the heir of the Sabbath, Sunday Sacredness, right? He says there's some other heirs which Protestants have brought away from the Catholic Church, such as sprinkling for baptism. How about the Trinity, the consciousness of the dead, and eternal life in misery? These are the things he said that the Protestants have brought in from the Catholic Church. They haven't given up, have they? Satan is not fighting churches, is he? He is joining them. Remember, he is transformed even as, uh, into an angel of light. He does more harm by sowing tares than by pulling up wheat. He accomplishes more imitation than by outright what? Opposition. This is what he's done. Moral confusion has been the result. Doctrinal confusion, sexual confusion, gender confusion, and the author of confusion is who? Satan. That's what he wants. He wants confusion within our churches and all that. So another comforter, we're told. Another comfort, if you look at the spirit of prophecy, I found 95 uh, uh, quotes using the word another comforter. The spirit of truth, 330 times in the spirit of prophecy. The comforter, 
is 339 times Spirit of Prophecy, four times the King James Bible. Holy Spirit, 9,210 times the Spirit of Prophecy, seven times in the King James Bible. Holy Ghost, 1,462 times in the Spirit of Prophecy and 89 in the King James Bible. Do you think the Holy Spirit might be important? Wow. He's known as these different uh, terminologies as well. John 14 tells us, and I will pray, Christ is praying the Father, and he shall give you what? Another comforter, because he himself was a comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth where? With you, and shall be in you, and I, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you, we're told. So he's going to give us another comforter. Another comforter in the Strong's Concordance, uh, New Testament 3, 38, 75, it, 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 the, the word in the Aramaic is, is what? Par, parakletos, an intercessor, a consoler, an advocate, or a comforter. John 14 says, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comfort that he, you understand the word he is a personal, personal pronoun. It's more definitive than even calling him a comforter, the Holy Spirit, that this is a third person. He knows Webster's 1828 dictionary is defined as a pronoun, a substitute for the third person, masculine, masculine gender, representing the man or male person named before it. So, so you understand, give you another comfort that he, that he is referring to who? Comfort, the word comforter here. So... Even the spirit of truth, spirit or pneuma, this is what God's or Christ's spirit, the Holy Spirit, meaning, again, this is a third person. Names of the Holy Spirit are, are used as dove, comforter, intercessor, presence of God, spirit, spirit of God, or how about spirit of truth? These are the different names of the Holy Spirit. Also, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, fear of the Lord. While some Christians accept these as a de definitive list of specific attributes, others understand them merely as examples of the Holy Spirit's work through the faith. These are, are attributes of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit can give you and I. The dove, this can be seen in the description in the baptism of Christ. Here's the text. I won't go through this. A dove symbolizes what? Peace. Also, a dove represents, uh, symbolizes purity or innocence and also beauty as well. These are the symbols of the Holy Spirit. Fire, fire as a symbol of the Holy Spirit is indicated in the statements about the Holy Spirit's baptism, the tongues of fire. And the tongues of fire on the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, fire, what does it do? Illuminates, warms, refines, purifies, and can change material from one form to another. Cannot the Holy Spirit uh, change us from being evil people to being good, godly people? Yes, if willing. The fire of the Holy Spirit is not about burning as some pro uh, project because the Bible never tells us that the Holy Spirit is given for our help. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit is given for our destruction, but for our what? Our help. The Holy Spirit is given not to destroy us, but to refine us. He's also referred to as an oil. In the Old Testament, priests were consecrated and ordained as oil was poured upon their heads. Kings also anointed with oil as they took up office. Oil was also used to keep the lamps burning in the holy place, and it was vital that they should never run dry. The Holy Spirit thus not only anoints and empowers for divine service, but also enlightens and lubricates. The Holy Spirit both illuminates and eliminates friction in our lives, doesn't he? Oil is also used to anoint the sick, correct? When is another symbol. When is a scriptural symbol signify, signifies life and activity. It sets forth the power and visibility immaterial nature and the sovereignty of the holy spirit the spirit's work in regeneration is like the wind and the coming of the holy spirit on the the uh, uh, on the pentecost day was described in terms of a sudden sound like what blowing of a violent wind 
Also, Holy Spirit is repre uh, represented as water. Jesus likened the Spirit, which the believer in him was to receive to streams of living water. The one who is filled with the Holy Spirit has this living water flowing from his innermost being. This analogy of the Spirit and water is also found in the Old Testament. The water's function of refreshing, cleansing, and refreshing correspond to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So we can see that the Holy Spirit can indeed speak for itself. Besides this, he can hear, he can guide, show, choose, call, and sends forth others. Now, what other characteristics does the, whole, does the Bible reveal about the Holy Spirit, which shows it to be a person and being other than God, the Father and God, the Son? So let's look at the Holy Spirit a distinct person. We can see that the Holy Spirit can indeed speak for itself. Besides this, he can hear, he can guide, show, choose, call, sends forth others. Now, what other characteristics does the Bible reveal about the Holy Spirit, which shows it to be a person and being other than God, the Father and God, the Son? The Holy Spirit has knowledge and searches all things. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit holds communion with us. These are distinct, distinct characteristics of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the, re, is the source of regeneration and renewal for salvation. The Holy Spirit resurrects the faithful from the dead. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible and moved upon the prophets to speak, right? As whole men of old were moved by the Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Spirit is another comforter other than Christ. The Holy Spirit helps our infirmities. The Holy Spirit can be tempted and what? Lied to. The Holy Spirit can be blasphemed and sinned against. The Holy Spirit is another intercessor other than Christ. The Spirit intercedes for us through how? Prayer. While Christ intercedes for us through his precious blood. Merits and righteousness as well. So each of the God, it has their distinct work for our salvation to do. So let's look at a comparative of Melchizedek. Paul describes, I'm sorry, declares about Melchizedek that he was the king of Salem, king of righteousness, king of peace, priest of the most high, who was without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto who? The Son of God, abided the priest continually. So look at Hebrews chapter 7, 1 through 4, and 17 to 22. Now Melchizedek was not Christ, because Christ was made a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was not the father, because no human has seen the father and lived other than who? Jesus, okay? In fact, Melchizedek could not have been any human being because the Bible states that he was without father, without mother, without descent, without either beginning of days nor end of life. So who but the Holy Spirit could have been who? Melchizedek, okay? So let's look at this. Next um, subject we need to address is spiritualism. The Holy Spirit, we're told from this book, proceeds from the Godhead, the infinite source of all. It is the breath of who? It's interesting that they use the word Godhead. It is the breath of Atman, the infinite power of God. It is not separate from, but operative through the Christ, the higher son. And this is from the Dictionary of All Scriptures and Myths by G.S. Gaskell that I refer to says the dictionary uses the philosophic, sacredly held writings of all religions, such as, such as Zoroaster, Thelos, and we talked about this earlier, where, where they use this from. So is this a correct definition of what the Holy Spirit is? No. This, again, is, is brought from the philosophic, um, uh, really from the pits of hell. Look at this other one. Put thy trust in the divine breath, the Holy Spirit which is the functioning of the absolute God upon the Buddhic plane. Now, if you all, and I don't have time to go through this, but if you have studied about spiritual formation, Lecto Divina, 
you will find that some of these words, the breath prayer. Who, what is this breath prayer? Again, it comes from mysticism, doesn't it? Eastern um, uh, uh, Orthodox um, based method, method, uh, mysticism as well. Look at this other one. Medieval theology generally distinguished the Holy Ghost as being the copula or the union between the Father and the Son. So the Holy Spirit is basically this power that keeps them united and all that. We're going to know that the difference between the Father and the Son is this. The Father is the express God hidden. The Son is the uh, God manifest. And the Holy Spirit is the knowledge of the Spirit of truth, proceeding from the experience of both as God hidden and revealed. Hmm. In the heart of the Trinity, and here's another one by Matthew Fox, or the one, the creator laughs and gives birth to the child. The child laughs back at the creator, and together they give birth to what? Isn't that disgusting? They give birth to the spirit. I, father of all things, order you, son, light, to go forth, to become as a guide to those who wander in darkness, that all men within whom dwells the spirit of my mind, this is the universal mind, may know, may have, or I can't read that, um, Saved by my mind in you, which shall call forth my mind in them, for I am my mind of the mysteries. And this is from the secret teachings of all ages. It says Hall is quoting Hermes or Kush, who was the interpreter of the mysteries, or basically the founder of spiritualistic Babylonian religion. Kush was also the father of Nimrod, who founded Babylon and then based its mystery religion upon the teachings of who? His father, Nimrod, based his teachings from the, what his father had, had been teaching and all. Thus, we can see that in both the Trinity doctrine as well as the um, um, mystery religion of ancient Babylon is taught the spiritualistic belief that the Holy Spirit is not a God himself, but is just an essence or the power or the, uh, of the manifestation of this one God, which is used both by the father and his son. And the really sad part of this is the fact that there are multitudes who innocently believe these spiritualistic teachings about the Holy Spirit, and yet they do not realize that they are in harmony with these same Trinitarian and Babylonian doctrines. Now, let me explain something to you. If you believe in the Godhead that there is three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three individual persons that work together in harmony that is called the Godhead. There are people that we, when I presented this a couple of months ago here at our church, there was a person that, that started calling my wife and myself and others, well, you guys are Trinitarians. And I told my wife, I said, the fact that she called us Trinitarians tells me that she doesn't even understand the Trinity. She would not call us Trinitarians then in the true definition and stuff. And so therefore it is of ignorance when, if people are going to call you Trinitarians, because then they don't understand because they haven't taking the time to study the truth for themselves. Continuing on, consequences, listen, consequences of denying the Holy Spirit. There's a consequence. The movement within Adventism that the Holy Spirit is not the third person, the Godhead, that he's an essence and all, there is consequences from denying that he is the third person, that he is part of the Godhead. Satan's hatred is intense against the three persons and God and God's making up the Godhead, especially against the Holy Spirit. And he has been do doing all that he can to attack the personage of the Holy Spirit itself, trying to uh, uh, the humanity to deny that the Holy Spirit exists as a third divine person and being in the Godhead. If the devil can get people to believe this spiritualistic, Trinitarian, and Babylonian doctrines that the Holy Spirit is not a God himself or that he is just a, another uh, essence or power or mind or just one God. Then he has succeeded in getting us to reject the Holy Spirit as a third person and third being of the Godhead. If we indeed believe this and reject the personage and Godhood of the Holy Spirit, then how? Let me ask you something. How can we expect the Holy Spirit itself to work for us? How can we expect the Holy Spirit to help us when we've rejected that 
he really exists. Those early Christian believers who did not know that the Holy Ghost existed did not have the Holy Spirit's power in their lives. This is, you can see this in Acts chapter 8 um, and also uh, chapter 18. And it will be the same with those who believe that there is not the third person, third living person and being in the Godhead, whose name is what? The Holy Spirit. This devilish attack against the Holy Spirit itself is being made by men who profess to be God's servants and ministers among the followers of God. These men may appear as the ministers of righteousness, yet they are a violent, uh, can't read that word, violent, uh, violating the spiritualist, or yet they are basically promoting the spiritualistic Babylonian doctrines of the devil. They claim and teach that the Holy Spirit is a living thir uh, third divine person or being of his own when he really is. Um, I'm, I guess they're not, I'm sorry. They claim, says when, they, when he really is, that he doesn't have a name or personality all his own. When he really has, and that he does not have in mind, he cannot think on his own when he really does. Because we've already seen, uh, showed you the evidence that the Holy Spirit has, has feelings, does not. He, you know, he has these different uh, attributes of, of the Holy Spirit that can um, convey to us, that can um, uh, speak to us and impress upon us. By their refusal to recognize the Holy Spirit as the third distinct living holy being, divine person and God of the Godhead does believe that he doesn't exist. They are denying him, insulting him, grieving him, doing him uh, disgrace to him and rejecting him. And Christ commands us not to do these things or else we will, we run the risk of committing the unpardonable sin and being what? Hopelessly lost. So what does the God, what does God require of all his followers? What does he require of each and every one of us? So what God command all of his people to do in regards to believing any of the doctrines of Babylon or in regards to being connected with any of the churches which believe and advocate any of these spiritualistic doctrines, thereby making them churches of what? Babylon. If we're in association with this and they teach the wrong doctrines, then how, what are we supposed to do? Are we not supposed to come out from among them and be ye separate? And what? Touch not the unclean. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are what? The temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. But when? When do we become the people of God, and he becomes our God? Listen, wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. So, before we can become the people of God and he becomes our God, we must do what? Separate ourselves out of these Babylonian churches holding to these spiritualistic doctrines. And we must no longer touch or hold on to or continue to believe these false, unclean, spiritualistic, doctrinal beliefs either. And what is the promise if we fulfill these two conditions? Being completely separated from all Babylonian doctrine and churches. Look. If this, this happens, then we're told, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, saith who? The Lord Almighty. When these conditions are met, then he will receive us. Then he will be our father. We will then be his sons and daughters. Since there is no agreement or union, harmony, companionship, or fellowship whatsoever between light and darkness, Christ and the devil, then there can be no agreement between these spiritualistic and Babylonian Trinitarian doctrines and what the Bible teaches is there. So even though church theologians and other scholars try to twist the Bible into seemingly agreeing with these spiritualistic and Trinitarian doctrines, yet God tells us that there is no agreement between the two, correct? 
the lies of the devil are not found being taught in God's word of truth because the two do not harmonize together. But the lies of the, of the devil are indeed found in the spiritualistic and occultic writings of his followers, which date back all the way to Babylon. And what does God require all of his true followers to do in regards to these Babylonian doctrines or the churches of Babylon which believe them? Depart ye, depart ye, go ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear what? The vessels of the Lord. When we have the truth that has God, God has given us, we are bearing the vessels of the Lord. We must be clean. And it's not just us clean. Leadership must be clean. Every, all the way to the, the, the head, the leadership of the church must be clean. Otherwise, we must depart, depart, and go out. We are clearly, clearly admonished by God that before we can become his children, and before he can become our God, that we must separate ourselves from all known false and spiritualistic doctrine of Babylon. We must also separate ourselves from all known churches which believe and teach these unclean doctrines of Babylon. This way, we can become clean and then be able to bear the vessels or the pure truths of God's word to all who will listen. And it is only after we fulfill these conditions of obedience to God's will that he becomes our God and we become his children. Thus, our salvation is at stake in this issue of what? The Trinity. We can lose our soul by remaining connected to these, to these, any of these spiritualistic heirs or to the Babylonian churches which promote these heirs. We're told in Jeremiah, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in what? Her iniquity. Revelation 18, 4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. If anyone knowingly refuses to give up these spiritualistic Babylonian and Trinitarian beliefs that there is only one God, the Father, and that this one God gave birth or bore or created or reproduced or produced or cloned or split off, etc., out of his own person to a son and other parts who share his essence, then they cannot claim to be the sons or daughters of God because they have not fulfilled the conditions necessary to become his children. In fact, God does not even claim them as his children until they fulfill these conditions. Then who does claim them as his children? Hmm. The one who is the author of these spiritualistic and Trinitarian beliefs or the father of lies himself, who? The devil. So let's look at this victorious living. Actually, apostles were told it is not a conclusive evidence that a man is a Christian because he manifests spiritual ecstasy under extraordinary circumstances. Holiness is not what? Rapture. It is an entire surrender of the will to God. It is living how? By every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. It is doing the will of our heavenly father. It is trusting God in trial, in darkness, as well as in what? Light. It is walking by faith and not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestioning confidence and resting in his love. Brothers and sisters, these last days, our relationship and time with God that we're spending now will be evidenced as trials, as temptations continue increasing. Will we fold? or will we stand in these last days? It is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Spirit is the Comforter, the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that in his work of guiding men into all truth, he shall not speak of himself, will he? He won't speak of himself. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of scripture and put a human construction on them. But the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. 
regarding such mystery, what did she say? Which are too deep for human understanding. Silence is golden. I've only given you a little bit. I don't know how the Holy Spirit works. I'm just thankful for it. I'm just giving you what the word of God and the spirit of prophecy says and what is not the Holy Spirit. The office of the Holy Spirit is distinctly specified in the words of Christ. When he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. If the sinner, I'm sorry, if the sinner responds to the quickening influence of the spirit, he will be brought to repentance and aroused to the importance of obeying what the divine requirements. The Holy Spirit will bring convictions because we will want to follow the truth to the repentant sinner, hungering and thirsting for the righteousness. The Holy Spirit reveals what the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He shall receive a mind and shall show it unto you, Christ said. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Spirit is given as a regenerating agency to make effectual the salvation wrought by the death of our Redeemer. The Spirit is constantly seeking to draw the attention of men to the great offering that was made on the cross of Calvary, to unfold to the world the love of God, and to open to, to the convicted soul the precious things of what? The Scripture. Having brought conviction of sin and presented before the mind the standard of righteousness, the Holy Spirit withdraws the affections from the things of this earth and fills the souls with what? A desire for holiness. The things of the world become strangely dim, right? In the light of what? His glory. He will guide you into all truth, the Savior declared. If men are willing to be what? Molded there will be brought about sanctification of the whole being. See, the Holy Spirit doesn't just do a part work. He does a complete work, doesn't he? The Spirit will take the things of God and stamp them on the soul. Your very DNA will transform into the image of Christ. By his power, the way of life will be made so plain that none need err therein. So let's look at a couple of things before I close. In 1888, 1901, and 1906, something of significance happened. In these three dates, the Holy Spirit wanted to be poured out, and Christ could have come to get his people. But why did the shower cease? Jeremiah 3, we're told, they say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But here we're told, but thou hast what? Played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes into the high places and see where thou hast not been lying with. In the ways hast thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness. And thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Sounds like our church, hasn't it? We pray the word and we want to be like the other churches and stuff like that. Therefore, look, the showers had been what? Because we played the whoredom, a whore, the showers have been withholding. What is the showers? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And there had been no latter rain. And thou hast a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me? My father, thou art the God of my youth. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldest. Hmm. Jeremiah goes on, says in uh, chapter three, go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep my anger forever. Only acknowledge what? Thy iniquity. God is only wanting to, us to acknowledge our iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city, two of a family, and I will bring you to where? To Zion. You see the loving 
us of God here in Jeremiah. He says, I am married to you. To the north lay Assyria and Media from Judea, where the ten tribes were carried by Tiglath-Pileser and Salmaneser. To the north was also Babylon. The northern tribes had been scattered by the Assyrians, and Judea was about to be taken captive by Babylon. They were to become exiles in Babylon, and they were given an opportunity to return or remain there if they so wished. Luther spoke of the Babylonian captivity of the church. Look. What was the central issue of the Reformation? Righteousness by faith. Did the Reformers stay the course? No. They failed miserably at the Council of Trent and then embraced Babylon in the Joint Declaration on Justification. This is where they fell. What was the central issue of the 1888 message? Righteousness by faith. Question is, did the leaders accept it? No, they attributed the revival to what? Fanaticism. So like the message we're told, there have been things written to me in regard to the movings of the Spirit of God at the last conference of 1893 and at the college, which clearly indicate that because these blessings were not lived up to, minds have been what? Confused. And that which was light from heaven has been called what? Excitement. I have been made sad to have this matter viewed in this light. We must be very careful not to grieve what, who? The Holy Spirit of God in pronouncing the ministration of his Holy Spirit as a species of fanaticism. How shall we understand the workings of the Spirit of God if it was not revealed in clear and unmistakable lines? Not only in Battle Creek, but in many places, the message of righteousness by faith, the message of the Alpha Holy Spirit was clearly, but it was still conveyed as fanaticism. Revian Herald says, it is a dangerous thing to doubt the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. For if this agency is doubted, there is no what? Reserve power left by which to operate on the human heart. Those who attribute the work of the Holy Spirit to human agencies, saying that an undue influence was brought to bear upon them, are what are they doing? Cutting their souls off from the fountain of blessing. Whatever may be the sin, if the soul repents and what happens and believes, guilt may be washed away by the atoning blood of Christ. But he who rejects the revealings of the Spirit of God and charges the work of God to what? Human instrumentalities is in danger of placing himself where repentance and faith will not come to him. He refuses to permit the Holy Spirit to melt his heart into tenderness and contrition. And that which should have softened him is looked upon as fanaticism. Thus he is led to refuse the heavenly gift Whatever plan God may devise to which to impress his heart will be thwarted through this suggestion of Satan. The evil one casts his hellish shadow between the soul and God, and the work of God is looked upon as excitement and delusion. The spirit strives in vain for all the sufficiency of the gospel is inefficient to subdue the soul and correct the air. The habit of resistance is so fixed. He has so long interpreted light to be darkness and fanaticism that the most manifest working of God's Holy Spirit becomes to him not a savior of life unto life, but through his unbelief is a savior of what? Death unto death, brothers. We've got to be very careful. That's why here in Selected Messages, we're told when the students at the school went into their um match games and football playing when they become absorbed in the amusement uh, uh questioning satan uh amusement satan saw it a good time to step in and make of none effect the holy spirit of god in molding and using the human subject had the teachers to a to a man done their duty had they realized their accountability see we we get into these games these competitive games and what does Satan do? He takes advantages of it. Competitive sports is way 
that allures our young people, then they cannot be entrusted with giving the last day message. Had they stood in more independence before God, had they used the ability which God had given them according to uh, sanctification of the spirit through the love of the truth, they would have had spiritual strength and divine enlightenment. Our young people would uh, understood they would have been standing. They would have been lights around the world, giving the truth to every person that's out there to press and, and on and on and upward to the ladder of progress, reaching, the he reaching heavenward. The fact is evident that they did not appreciate or walk in the light to follow the light of what? They gave up the light of life to the light of the world, and it becomes darkness, doesn't it? Going on, it is an easy matter to idle away, talk and play away the Holy Spirit's influence. To walk in the light is to keep moving onward in the direction of the light. If the one blessed becomes negligent and inattentive and does not watch unto prayer, if he does not lift up the cross and bear the yoke of Christ, if his love of amusements and strivings for the mastery absorb his power or ability, then God is not made the first and best and last in everything. And Satan comes in to act his part in playing the game of life for his soul. He can play much more earnestly than they can play and make deep laid plots for the ruin of who? Of souls. So we cannot, brothers and sisters, as I conclude, we cannot now afford to miss the outpouring of the Holy Spirit this time, the last time, can we? We cannot miss it because there will not be given an opportunity. 1888, as I mentioned earlier, the Holy Spirit wanted to come. 1901, the Holy Spirit wanted to be poured out. 1903, but guess what? The people and the leaders didn't want it. Do you want the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to be preparing you for these, the last message of mercy that we're to give to a lost and dying world? If so, we must understand these truths for ourselves. We must not grieve the Holy Spirit, give the honor and the glory to the Holy Spirit that is due him so we can be prepared not only for the early reign, perfection of character, but also the latter reign, giving that trumpet a certain sound, giving a warning to these people that they may be arrested in their sins, that they will come to God and that they will surrender themselves, asking God, forgive me of my sins, help me, and that they can give their life and their all to him. Thank you for coming, and shall we, if possible, can we kneel together as we close in prayer? Precious Father of truth, precious Father that loves us with a love that we can understand, but we're thankful for. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Spirit that wants to come into our lives to help us to correct us of sin and of righteousness, to help us, Father, to be um, better than overcomers, Lord that we may go from glory to glory. Father, forgive us if we have come short of your glory. Forgive us, Lord, for not believing the truth, the way, the truth, and life. Forgive us, Lord, where we have neglected our time in studying with you, about you, to pray uh, to you, praying for one another, that we may, Lord, get in this habit, because as time progresses, as persecution, as trials come upon us, that our first thought will be of you. Our first thought is praying to you, and that our faith and trust in you has been building, getting stronger and stronger, and that we'll be ready for the, when the, to, uh, the time comes. So bless our brothers and sisters at Colton. Guide them, fill them with a double measure of your Holy Spirit. Help them to make right decisions because we cannot make any wrong decisions. We cannot, do not have time, Father, to do these things. So everything that we think, everything that we do, everything, Lord, that we react, will be into your honor and glory, Father, and that many souls will come and that Colton will be filled with those that are hungry and thirsting for Christ's righteousness. Thank you again for this time. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.